I'm lucky enough to live in Oxford, one of the most beautiful cities in the south of England. But just occasionally, I long to head off somewhere new. Where this time? Ah, yes, Jordan. Perfect. For Hanan and I, today's Jordanian menu involves a heavy dose of sugar and a sojourn in the dusty desert. But there's still enough time for a quick stop en route. Following our noses, we track down some enticing street food. The freshest meat is, as soon as being butchered, it goes straight onto kebab sticks. That is the best meat you can have. And they have lots of different kinds of spices. Here, when you refer to baharat, it means mixed spices. Oh, that's right, because in England so, we're now beginning to see um, baharat being sold as a particular spice yes. blend, but that's wrong. Yes. yes, you can make your own baharat. The favourite mix that you had, it's also called baharat. So he's probably put cumin, coriander, black pepper, and it almost always goes with onions and tomatoes. Lovely, just grilled on the, on the charcoal. The softly spiced skewers of lamb are just a small part of the whole meal. Laid alongside of the tomatoes and onions, kept warm with a blanket of fine shrunk bread. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. So you also have, here you have, mutaba? Mutaba, yes. Hummus? Hummus, yeah. Uh, cucumber, uh, shasha. Uh, and... I see, I see. Oof, no more chit-chat. The hungry customer wants his food. And Hanan and I must make a move too, as we have a rendezvous with a purveyor of sweet pleasure. The Al Karawan Confectionery Factory has been turning out scented sweets since 1949. It's a family business presided over by the grand matriarch, Mary Biller. Under her watchful eye, her three sons keep the business flourishing, turning out an abundant range of sweetmeats. I have to say, this perplexed me slightly because they look, to me, very like chickpeas. Yes, they are chickpeas. You learn something every day. I've never seen a sugar-coated chickpea before in my life. What about all your other products? I can now see this down is, uh, there. Yes. Sugar-coated uh, almonds. And what are these orange things? These are nougat with amaradin. It is uh, apricot. Ah, oh, how delicious. Apricot syrup. What about this? What's this? This is another shape of uh, manna. Manna from manna? Heaven. Yes. We make it rectangular, cut it, mm -hmm. and cover it with pistachio, not like traditional manna. And what does the original manna look like? It looks like this, as you see in the picture mm -hmm. here. Lovely white snowballs. It's a little bit rough, it's a little bit rounded. And with lots of lovely nuts on the inside. Yeah. This manna takes its name from the biblical manna from heaven, which God provided for the Israelites during their travels in the desert. It's an Iraqi favorite, but it's enormously popular here in Jordan, too. Firaz Bile offers to show us how it's made. We here start mixing the sugar and the glucose uh, syrup, and then at a certain degree, we put it in the mixer here, and now it's the time to put the nuts. What nuts go into it? Uh, almonds and pistachios. Lovely. And also this material, the secret of the menu. This all-important ingredient is sap resin, from the tamarisk tree, said to have been the original manna from the biblical story. We make a syrup of that, mm -hmm. and then we add it to the, to the mixing. And now, one of the most tasting ingredients, the cardamom. Of course. Oh, oh, it's, it's cardamom. <laughs> There's cardamom in everything. Do you put any olive oil in this? No. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so good. Now we will, we'll uh, put another heat in order to have a good mixture. Wow. Smells so nice. Oh, heavens, that looks very, very tempting. The molten mixture is scooped out of the container and transferred to a tray covered in flour to keep it from sticking. Next, it's shaped by hand. So this is brilliant. They're taking it and just rolling into a nice sausage shape and then yeah. cutting it yes. into little pieces. These days, we have adopted a new machine to make it round without cutting with hands. Oh, look. Yes. This gentleman is just 
What, coating them again in flour? We are cooling uh, it down on flour to keep its shape. Why don't you try it? Oh, I think I could force myself to. Can I just pick one out? Yes. Are you this, having one? Th this one is escaped, no, so it's... I'll rescue it. I think you should. <laughs> it obviously is meant for you. Uh, of course. It's still yes. all soft. It's yes. still... Oh, this is heaven. This is still... This really is manna from heaven, <laughs> and it's still slightly soft manna from heaven. Mmm. It is beautiful. Mm. I mean, obviously, it's sweet and soft and sticky, but you also have that flavour of cardamom mm. and another rather elusive scented flavour. It must be the, that, that odd block, that resinous stuff <laughs> from the Manor of Heaven Tree. Now, obviously, it's not going to be sold like this. What happens to it now? Now, after we cool it down, we keep it for one day with this trays uh, covered with flour, and then we go to the section of packaging to see what we will do next. Okay. 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 Bye. We are removing now the flour from the uh, manna, so we can wrap it here on the machine. Oh, look! Doesn't look cute. It's a little pile of snowballs. Yeah, more like soldiers. <laughs> And off they go into the lion's den, and through there, through there, through there, through there. Then they emerge, ready wrapped and ready to head off on their journey. The work, the work is almost done now. <laughs> All done by these ladies and gentlemen. Wow, yes. wow, they do produce a wonderful, wonderful product. So thank you. Welcome. Sugar rush over, Hanan and I drive out into the eastern desert to visit three castles which form part of what has become known as the Desert Castles Loop. These castles are early Islamic buildings dating from the 7th century when Jordan was ruled by the Umayyad dynasty. Each castle has its own distinct character, but mystery surrounds their actual purpose. One theory has it that over the centuries each was adapted to form a weekend retreat for clan leaders longing to get away from the hurly-burly of politicking and fighting. We start our tour with a forbiddingly fortress-like Khazar al Halene. This used to be a, a sort of an inn, and um, apparently these are ch water channels leading to the well that was, mm -hmm. was here. There used to be a, a balcony here, so, and you can see the remnants of it going all the way around. But this was really, I mean, must have been in the middle of nowhere in those days. Well, that's exactly why it's here, so that they can service caravans, they can, you can have, you, you meet with the local Bedouins. Um, it's a it's service station, really. I love the thought of that. It's a service station. Yeah. We dive deeper into the bowels of this ancient rest stop. Oh, come in here, look. Oh, goodness me. Oh, wow. Beautiful. I love the way they've set those three columns at a time. Brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, there's so many nice little details. Look at those little zigzaggy, um, what, what, what do you call it? Decorative things up there. Yeah. Um, and lovely little slits of windows. And the other circles with the patterns and the sort of leaf patterns. Yes. Really charming. Uh, the only thing that strikes me, in fact, is that there's no, well, there isn't much natural light in here. It's, it's a lovely room. Maybe to keep it to keep it cool. We we are, right. So, what do you think this room might have been used for? Well, it, it, it seems to lead to four separate rooms, and the fact that it's so grand. Possibly, this is a meet and greet or a sitting room for dignitaries. It's lovely. As we clamber up to the top of the castle, Hanan gives me a potted history of the Umayyad rulers. After the Prophet Muhammad came four Khalifas. What's a Khalifa? Khalifa is a ruler, basically. Right. The last one, Ali, the governor of Syria, Muawiyah, disputed the succession of Ali to become a Khalifa. So after Ali was assassinated, he took over and set up the Umayyad dynasty and these wonderful desert castles. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful place. But yeah. a, there is a, you know, one odd thing about them. Well, yeah. It's not that surprising these days. But you, know, you walk up towards it and it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere until yeah. you get close yeah. and then suddenly you realise there's a big road behind us and great big <laughs> lorries hurtling <laughs> up and down and up and down and up and down. It's quite noisy. I know, I know. <laughs> there used to be caravan trails between all these desert castles, but now we have motorway trails. <laughs> what can you do? Inevitable yeah. modernisation. <laughs> 
Noisy or not, the access to the desert castles granted by these new roads was something we became thankful for, as they really are stuck right out in the middle of nowhere. Next on our tour is the tiny Qasar Amra, famous for its sensuous erotic frescoes. Our equally sensuous guide, Hakim Saud al-Sabila, might have been made for the place. This 8th century bathhouse was built for Al-Walid I, an Umayyad caliph. Can I ask you a question? Because to me, this seems very small for a, a royal mm. palace. He built just private for him, you know, and for his friends. Mm. Ah, right, so it was just it was a place for him to get away from. Yeah. Underneath the sauna rooms are fireplaces to heat the water taken from this extremely deep well. This is 45 meters. When they get full of water, the water go out. And, you know, in summertime, they need, you know, it was very hot and they need more to drink to also for the animals. The water was heaved up from the well with this large winch, which would have been turned by a donkey. Very clever indeed. The highlight of a visit to the Qasar Amra is its startlingly lively frescoes, some of the best preserved examples of Umayyad painting. Of course, it's not just the quality or the preservation that engages the eye, but also their content. Naked courtesans, hunting scenes, and many more depictions of love yes. and ardor. Not at all what you associate with Islamic art. This is Muslim. Yeah, but you know, he's Islamic. Yes. He's not lived the Islamic way. Right. You know, oh, he right. just wants to enjoy his life. But this is a and private dwelling. Yeah, it's a private yeah, house. He, he was thinking nobody will come. Yes. Like, you know, secret for him. <laughs> yeah. This extraordinary building was designed purely for pleasure, from the exuberant interior decor to the 8th century mood lighting. Oh, wow. Oh. Now this is the hot water. They come from here, uh -huh. okay? And they mix it with the cold water there. Uh -huh. And they're sitting down here in this kind of stone. Mm -hmm. They make shawar and they do the hot water. And then they see the zodiac sign. So those are the signs of the zodiac up yeah. there? Isn't that lovely? So you would just come sit here after your sauna and just and relax. relax, look yeah. back. The First the sauna, uh -huh. okay, and then making a shower here, and enjoy when you see the old sign. Beautiful. And, yeah. What a lovely life. Yes. There's one more castle on our list, but before that, a spot of refreshment in the Bedouin tent. Hakim knows all the right moves. How on earth does he do that? Tearing Hanan away from gorgeous, shimmying Hakim is no easy task. But at last we arrive at the severe black basalt castle of Azraq. This Roman fortress is secured by a pair of the most extraordinary doors I've ever come across. Each of these solid stone doors weighs an astonishing one tonne. Good heavens! <laughs> these are incredible! These stone doors! Do they work? Yes. Oh, that's why you need a bit of uh, <laughs> muscle <yeah>. power. <laughs> Look at the hinges down below. Hanan and our guide lead us around the ruined castle. This was built by the Romans, 3rd century AD. The Mamluks built over this castle. Mm -hmm. And what you see today is what the Mamluks built. One of the castle's more famous occupants was T.E. Lawrence, who stayed here for a week in 1917 during the Arab Revolt. A decade after Lawrence's time here, a devastating earthquake shook the fortress to its foundations, destroying the upper levels and reducing it to the single-walled expanses we see today. Luckily, restoration works mean that we can still visit Lawrence's room. He used to have a bed here and a place to sit down, mm -hmm. and uh, this is also where today, if you want to escape the cold, mm -hmm. you sit here and light up some fire, and which is why they have these black patches all over the place. Ah, oh, right. OK, right. that makes For sense, doesn't it? T. Lawrence is, I mean, he's very romanticized. The reason why they like Lawrence a lot, A, he behaved like he was one of them, and he lived like he was one of them. What he did for the Arabs and helped them lead uh, an army to fight the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, is what they remember him for. The final stop on our tour around the castle is the original prayer hall. This is lovely. How elegant. Right. Yeah. In the Roman times, this used to be either a church or some kind of prayer hall of some yeah. sort as well. So the Mamluks built it on top 
of yeah. this particular, yeah. for that reason. So these are the original Roman arches? Yes. Yeah. Can I ask also about the ceiling? Because I noticed this in, um, in T.E. Lawrence's room as well. And Lawrence, this wonderful ceiling with a long stone supporting yes. everything. Corbelling or coupling design. You see above the arches have stone, and both at the top is long stones. Ah. Stones and the stones only. This is yeah. all made of and stones. Exactly, amazing. all made of stones. From parched desert fortresses yeah. to aquatic wetlands, once yeah, again, Hanan nice. and I are coming face to face with the stark contrasts of the Jordanian landscape. This is so beautiful. Isn't it? Very peaceful. Yeah. Well, quite peaceful. It's actually, these <laughs> frogs are really <laughs> noisy. <laughs> yes, they are having a, a great party, I think. <laughs> Tell me a bit about this place. This is called Azraq Wetland Reserve. And the reason is because Azraq in Arabic is blue. And one look at the water, you'll understand why it's called Azraq now. Absolutely. There seems to be an awful lot of water here. I don't think I've seen as much water in Jordan except at the Dead Sea. That's because this is the only oasis we have in Jordan. Unfortunately, the water is depleting. Um, it's a choice between either watering people in Amman or watering the animals that rely on this wetland. <sighs> it's a very difficult one, isn't it? It very, is. Very, very difficult. Yes. What kind of animals are there here? Mostly birds, but we also have foxes, wolves, jackals, water buffaloes. But we used to have huge numbers of migrating birds passing by here. But the numbers are dwindling because of the water shortage. And there must be, it's just not enough to go around, is yeah. it? Still, it's a, a great place for families to visit. And the more people know about it, the more people will participate in trying to save this place. Well, it is a remarkable place and it would be a huge tragedy if Absolutely. it were to disappear forever. Yes, for sure. Over recent evenings, Hanan and I have spotted an interesting phenomenon as we drive home. And tonight we are determined to get to the bottom of it. Time to gate crash. Not a house party, not a street party, but a pavement party. Hello. Hello, hello. marhaba. Yeah, hello. Keep hello, hello. hello. I'm telling them you're from the UK and you're my friends. <laughs> 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 you look good, comfortable. Uh, every two, three days, but especially Fridays and Saturdays, they do this. They get the mint all together and they have, they're cooking a meal, obviously. But so what are, what, are they, they cooking? what are they cooking? This is, uh, this is tomato, aubergine, potatoes, mm -hmm. onions, and of course, chicken. So yeah. well, how are they going to cook? What are they, they going to do? They are going to put it on the fire, barbecue it. Love A real life fire. And I love it, look, they've got the nuggets. Oh, yeah, yeah, they have, they're looking at cushions and everything. This to me is great, <laughs> but it's a bit odd because they're, we're right by a road. Yes, I know. <laughs> we're a big we're basically, road. The Dead Sea is that way. Oh, so we're not really it. by a road, it's <laughs> more like a fire Dead Sea. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> They're inviting us to join them for dinner. <laughs> These are special herbs for barbecuing. Jordanian hospitality is renowned, and soon we're sitting down amongst the men. Oh, that's so Chicken. kind. Thank Two you. complete strangers bowl up. Unbelievable. And they're on that's their night the away from the women as well. <laughs> Within a remarkably short time, Hanan is back on her feet, clapping and dancing to the music. Welcoming though these guys are, I can see that it's really a boys' night out. We take our leave, heading off to drum up our own party and to make our very own party food. Those guys were having such a good time, weren't they? Yes. Away from their wives, away from the women. <laughs> I don't understand is that it's okay for them to take time off, but it's not okay for the women to take time off. <laughs> but it is okay for us to, to take, take time, time off, off. Okay. and to do some cooking. So let's start making fettat hummus. hummus. First, we toast the flatbreads until crisp and dry fry a handful of pine nuts. These are browning pretty fast. Here, put them here. Okay. So you toast these until they're really crisp. Yeah, why don't we get on with oh. this while that's happening? Okay. This is Greek-style yogurt. So I'm going to mix it with 
the garlic. Yep. I'm also going to use some tahini, which is sesame seed paste. How much tahini you put is really according to taste. And how is your taste? You, you've got quite a taste I for tahini. I love tahini. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hanan puts in quite a lot. <laughs> oh, look, they're beginning to toast. Oh, well done. You're looking after them. How do you think those two are? These are wonderful. So, okay. do you just take pieces of this wonderful bread mm -hmm. and try not to eat any of it. I think I'm going to declare the pine nuts officially cooked. So that's our pine nuts, okay. a little lightly toasted. Next, we tip cooked chickpeas into the pan, then cover with water, crumble in a stock cube, and heat it all up. Shall I help you with the... Yes, um, please. The fatty. Fatty. That's quite difficult. <laughs> so you can fet for tea um, all kinds of different ways. Absolutely. That's the basic of any feta, is bread at the bottom, chickpeas and broth on top, and then whatever you fancy. Oh, that's a nice crisp one. Mm. You can actually buy this ready-made, ready roasted or toasted. It's much more fun, though, doing it on, um, on a barbecue like this, <laughs> on a not work. very good barbecue. <laughs> Should we see how the not very happy chickpeas are on the barbecue? Well, look, they're steamy. So, so first thing we have to do is wet the, the bread. So we, want, we now want to soften it. Can I just ask? <laughs> yeah, I know what you're You know what I'm going to ask, then. Can I just ask, why did, Hanan, why, why, why did we did go to all that effort of, of grill, toasting the bread, breaking it up, and now you're making it soft again? <laughs> That's just the way it is. <laughs> you, if you did that with just plain bread, it would not taste the same, and it would not absorb it the same way that this is absorbing it now. The chickpeas are then spooned over the soaked bread, followed by a seasoning of spices. Cumin, coriander, pepper, chili, and salt. You're just stirring the surf in the top the layer, surface, isn't it? Yeah. OK, so basically now comes the yoghurt. Yoghurt is such a big thing. I mean, you've got here sort of the essential elements of the Jordanian diet. Yeah. It's looking good already. Hanan finishes the dish with chopped parsley, the toasted pine nuts, and the blush red of pomegranate seeds. And how fascinating. It looks so beautiful and so stunning, but it's also very homely at the same time, isn't it? Yes. yes. And guess what we're missing? It's that gorgeous olive oil. Oh, 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 it just looks so beautiful. Now can we taste it? Hmm. Mm. How incredible is that? Really simple, basic ingredients, mm -hmm. and the impact of a mix of things. It's really, really good. I'm going to be making that for my kids when I get home. Try experimenting with also adding different layers, like aubergines in particular. I'm going to have every layer in the book in there. <laughs>